Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, before we get started, I want to I share a brief story that I think sets up well uh, part of the debate that we'll have tonight. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it because it's a tightly scripted debate in terms of time. I'm going to try to be really hard about allowing just the right number of minutes per side, which is going to make it more difficult for our discussants than it otherwise would be. Uh, but uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, I saw a fascinating story written up on Facebook. There's a, a soccer field on, I think, 11th Street Northwest, just a little bit south of Wonderland. So that places it well for some of you. Uh, I used to go to Wonderland once in a while back in the day. And, uh, and recognized that every evening there were soccer games played on that field. And I would look jealously at the games going on because I wanted to play and I'd have to go to Wonderland instead. Poor me. Um, and this article that I came across on the Facebook described how that pickup soccer game, which had become a community institution, uh, was threatened with destruction because the government, which owns the, owns the school uh, and, the, and the soccer field, uh, had decided to start permitting use of the field. And they awarded a permit based on a $700 fee or something like that to a local sports organizing group. And the sports organizing group went to the field on the appointed day that they had the permit, and they said to all the pickup players, oh, you're not playing here. We are because we have this permit. Well, in the, in the, uh, in the aftermath, the, uh, it, the, the community was upset by this because it really had become an institution. Uh, parents bringing in their children, uh, volunteering to go out and buy nets for the, for the, uh, the goals and everything else. Um, Maybe the story suggests there might have been near fisticuffs on, on one or two occasions when the interlopers came in. In the aftermath, the organized group decided to back off and, and release their permit so, so that the uh, uh, unscheduled play could continue. And I think that's a neat illustration of several things, um, some of which are relevant here. The field had essentially been accorded commons. Uh, property treatment. That is, the government owned it and had the power to regulate it, but by benign neglect had allowed the community to just take this field and use it as they wanted in the evenings. The, the community used it productively and take, took steps to maintain it and everything else. Then, th this is the part of the story that isn't so relevant, the government came in and regulated the use of the, of the field in a way that arguably undercut uh, undercut community values and, and cut into a, a, a community tradition that, that many felt was important. Was there an alternative to make it private property and allow that field to be used uh, according to the highest and best use, which would be probably signaled by, uh, by price, the price that people were willing to pay? That's another way of organizing the use of this field. But it illustrates, I think, quite well the, the distinction between commons and, in this case, the sort of quasi-property allocation of the field. Here we're talking about information as property and whether or not it should have that, that property treatment, whether it should have a commons treatment, and they're, they're both very interesting questions. Uh, so we do have an, a, a formally organized debate, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, Sasha Moss and Christian Sout each to introduce themselves uh, in the first minute, which I won't count against you. Um, as they take the uh, affirmative statement uh, and the negative to the following, I suppose, three questions. Uh, is copyright a property right? Do copyright protections facilitate innovation? And is copyright a property right with its protection a proper focus of the Congress under the Constitution? So that's three statements on which you can take the affirmative or the negative position. Making the affirmative opening statement, I believe is Christian, you'll be allocated six minutes plus that one minute to take us through your salient introduction. There are plenty of, plenty of stuff you can copy and paste off a of website, many of which you already saw and what brought you here. So I'll let Christian do a minute and then um, you give me a high sign or I'll give you a high sign and your six minutes will begin at the conclusion of which, which I'll start coughing and doing this and that to menace you until you, you finish up. Very good. Because you, you're not, I'm the moderator. I will be the one throwing things. Yes, yes. Uh, so please, Christian, go ahead. Uh, who I am, right? who, who you are, the salient points, and then start your six minutes. Okay. Please. Is this thing on? No. Okay. Well, I'll just project. Uh, so my name is Christian Stout. We may, we may want you for a recording. So oh, why don't you speak into the microphone nonetheless. Check. Ah, there we go. <laughs> 
Christian Stout. I am an attorney. I work at the International Center for Law and Economics, which is a, a think tank that uh, works on um, applying law and economics methodology to questions of public policy and law. If you're not familiar with it, in a thumbnail, essentially we try to take economic analysis and, and try to convince regulators and judges and, and lawyers why they should actually perform rigorous analysis before they decide what's good for public policy. Uh, we don't always win, but we try. Um, my background, I, I was a software developer for years before I became a, uh, an attorney, and um, now I work on intellectual property issues, uh, consumer protection, uh, telecommunications, um, and, and antitrust. So that's Pretty good enough for a background, right? Please. Okay. So I'll take the affirmative case for uh, saying that copyright is in fact a property right. Uh, the, the general overview, in case you want to fall asleep for the next five minutes, is that I believe that copyright is a property right that deserves protection just like any other intellectual property or tangible property right that the state would recognize. Um, we protect, and the reason why is that it's a good idea to have copyright as a, a, a property right, not just uh, not, not because it's something about the nature of copyright demands it. And I think that's true for all property rights, which I'm going to go through in a minute to say exactly why copyright is exactly the same thing as a right in, in tangible property. Yes, I do think it is the proper focus of the Congress to focus on uh, copyright as a property right because uh, Clause 8 of, the, of uh, uh, Article 1 does list it as one of the enumerated powers and it's notable for the fact that the Constitution is generally a charter of negative liberties. It says what the government's not allowed to do in this one section. It does vest the, the government with some power to, to act in the series. So I think it's a proper focus. But again, I don't think that we want to protect copyright just because the founding generation thought it was a good idea. I think it continues to be a good idea. It yields a lot of economic benefit. Um, societies that have strong intellectual property protections have good knowledge economies, have good information economies, and you see a lot of production of, of useful arts and sciences. So that's my basic uh, uh, view. So there could be another way to protect intellectual property. As Jim noted, you could have a common system. You could have a patronage system, which existed for millennia, uh, where you'd have a rich family that would make sure artists produce paintings or would fund scientists and produce new things. You could do that. That's not what we do have. What we do have is a system that is generated enormous amounts of welfare for society because inventors and artists feel like their investment is going to be rewarded in the marketplace. And I, I, although I do think there are problems with our system, there's problems with any system, I think that the wise course is to actually look for tweaks within the system that make it more efficient and make it have the ends we want rather than blowing it up and moving into a completely commons-based uh, uh, system. So property, I want to just give a brief overview of what I think property is in order to be able to then say exactly what I think intellectual property is. I think property is actually an infringement on liberty at the core, and this is where I, I tend to diverge with libertarians. I am a libertarian. But libertarians tend to mix up liberty and property together, I think, in a way that is not logically necessary. I think that liberty emerges from the state that we are moral, autonomous agents. We have liberty naturally by virtue of the fact that we're these sentient thinking creatures, and everyone is, is bound to respect that, and I think that the natural law translates pretty easily into the positive law when you're thinking about issues of liberty. Property, not so much. Property, I believe, is a Pareto optimal, uh, enhanced, uh, a Pareto optimal infringement on the natural liberty of persons. So I have a natural uh, ability within myself because I'm a moral agent to say that you're not allowed to violate me as long as I don't violate let you, right? That's the, in a nutshell, the libertarian view of, of liberty. But it's kind of weird when I then say that I then have a right to property. I say that this is mine. So something magically makes this become part of me. And, and the only way you can really justify that, I think, is on utilitarian grounds, to say that it makes society better off to assign a system of private property rights uh, that help us to order scarce resources and trade them efficiently. Uh, so so uh, Property in that sense is a staking out of a claim over a thing, whether it's tangible or intangible, and then having some entity enforce that property right. Now, in a state of nature, it would be me with a sword waving it at you to keep you away from my bottle of water. In a civilized state, it's the police with swords waving it at you to keep away from my property. But in any instance, we're, we're staking a claim and we're using force to enforce our property right. That's the same whether it's my house, whether it's a song I write, they're all the same. Uh, so what is IP? in this concept. Intellectual property, it, the, the, the account I just gave for anybody who's a law student or who's a lawyer, it is essentially the bundle of rights theory of, of property. All 
property is is a legal entity, whether it's a hard law, like in statutory law or that a court passes, or it's the norms of a, of a small community, uh, it's a concept that there is something that uh, the law will recognize and enforce, some entitlement to property, and it's got attributes to it. Now, many of those attributes are things like exclusive possession, uh, or the right to exclude is a prop up a, 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 a a generally considered uh, property right in, in our system, but it's, it's just one attribute of a, a, a piece of property. Whether it's easy to enforce those particular attributes of property or not has nothing to do with whether something should be considered property. Either we consider something property or we don't. Now, it might be hard to enforce our rights, as it is with copyright online, and it might be relatively easier as it is with keeping people out of our house, but that doesn't change the fact that, as a legal construct, they're both pieces of property. Uh, as an example, house, right? And if I want to keep people out of my house, it's pretty easy. I lock the doors, I have a shotgun, I can sit on my porch with my shotgun and rock and chair menacingly. People won't come into my house. I'm also a musician. I write music, I put it on the internet, and it's really hard for me to keep people from pirating it. But if I had a bigger house that had 15 garages and 100 rooms and was on 300 acres, and it would be really hard for me to keep people from camping out in one of my garages because the monitoring costs are very high, that doesn't change the fact that I still have a property right in my giant sprawling mansion. Just because it's hard for me to keep people out of that mansion that it is for me to keep people out of my little house. It's the same idea. Because I write that song, just because it's hard for me to keep people from pirating that song, doesn't change the fundamental nature of the fact that it's a Pareto optimal improvement that in the end yields better benefits to society. Okay, so uh, I'll wrap up real quickly. Um, the, two, the two common criticisms are, uh, of property that I, I hear from liber other libertarians is the one that's it's hard to exclude. I, I don't think that's a good one. Uh, another one is the fact that, um, well, the state grants you, it's essentially a monopoly. The state grants you a privilege and, and, you know, we don't like monopolies, we don't like the government, therefore it must be bad. But on my account of property, and I think on the logically correct account of property, all property is a monopoly, if you're going to call it that, right? So. Uh, if, if you want to call it a monopoly. My right over my house is a monopoly in the same way a copyright is, or they're both property. You can't have it any other way. Thank you, Christian. We'll go to Sasha Moss, give her a minute uh, to, to introduce herself in the, in the uh, relevant way, and then six minutes for the uh, uh, negative opening statement. Great. Well, thank you. My name is Sasha Moss, and I'm a technology policy manager at the R Street Institute. Don't ask me what R Street stands for. I have been there now a year, and I still don't know how the president got her name of R Street. So as a technology policy manager, I talk about copyright, patent, trademark, intellectual property gambit, open data, and digital free speech. Before I joined R Street, I was a council Republican member on the Judiciary Committee. I handled his technology portfolio. And in his portfolio, we helped craft really cool bills from the You and Your Devices Act to the Open Data Act, essentially kind of giving power back to users and citizens like yourself. Before I joined the, um, the Hill, I was a research assistant for Robert Brandeis at GW Law School, who we like to call a copyright maximalist in our field. So my point of view is quite nuanced, as you'll see. So I've schooled, per se, much like my esteemed colleague to my right, but I have developed my viewpoints over the past three, four years since I've graduated a master's degree in intellectual property. Great. So before I begin, I just want to pose a quick question. I'm not really skilled in debate. I'm more a panelist, per se. But take a quick poll. How many of you in this room have a cell phone? I'm assuming most of you here. <laughs> I have an iPad in front of me. So what you possess in your hand is an incredibly powerful piece of machinery. And it's riddled with intellectual property, from its sleek outward design to the code that makes it a phone, essentially do phone things, make it function. It's a set, some of its parts per se. So if you were to modify the code or sell it on, you'd be liable for copyright infringement. Why? You merely license the bits in the phone that make the phone do phone things. I know it's a strange concept. You've got, you've got a contract from a carrier. You, in two years, you're going to own the phone. And then you tell me that I can't tinker with my phone, that I can't all the apps I bought, I'm not going to transfer over. It's weird. Because that's intellectual property at work. It's a licensing agreement, per se, at least when it comes to software. So before I delve deeper, I think it's best I establish again that I'm not against our both system of copyright, per se. In fact, I believe it incentivizes creators to think of new and wonderful worlds and literature, write music that speaks to the soul, and as follow media, allow consumers to enjoy the fruits of their labor from their fellow beings in this world. However, I do believe our current system of copyright in tandem with that as imagined by our founders isn't working. So, as my colleague mentioned in Article 1, Section 8, Clause A of our Constitution, Copyright of the Progress Clause, or Copyright and Patents Clause, 
It specifically states the U.S. Congress shall have the power to, and I quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right in respect to their writings and discoveries. While many of my colleagues might argue it's a natural right, I would quickly like to point out my colleague Eli Dorado who sat on a Cato panel with our moderator back in 2016 noted it's a power, not an obligation. Utilitarian in nature, it's not a blessing in liberty. It's a limited right. I cannot think of any natural rights which are subject to, which are subject to limitations, to exemptions in time and scope. It's a government program, not to mention it can be held by two people at once. So think back to the cell phone example I used earlier, how you license the code, you're using it, but someone else kind of owns it. So what's that? You can't be in a house, you can, two people can be in a house, but only one person owns the house. So furthermore, the first copyright I codified in 1799 printed copies of maps, charts, and books, modeled the 1709 British Statute of Anne. And it gave the right to protect a work for a limited time of 14 years with the option of renewal after a six month period, the term of 14 year ends. Now, copyright protects a wide scope of intellectual property, everything from software to sculpture to writings and books. It's expanded as our artistic scheme has expanded. It's just been with the culture itself. So I'm not saying anything's wrong by that. I'd like to go in deep about software, but I'm not gonna do that moment. <laughs> so copyright has been evolving as our, as we progress as beings and people are more incentivized to do things. And I think copyright does have that place. However, I'd like to go on. There's some really scary to it all. For example, I've been doodling, copying notes. Now, because it was fixed in a tangible medium, what would I tell you right now that I could go get a registry, registry for the copyright office, deposit it, and now my doodles, which really make no sense, maybe if you're Jackson Pollock with his beautiful art, it would make sense to some obscure art critic in New York, but I'd be able to profit off that. So whenever time you scribble on your notes and it looks kind of similar, I'd come after you and say, hey, that's my work. So you need to license it from me right now. And then, because I'm not cheap, they say, well, I can't afford to do that, and lo and behold, I could collect statutory damages ranging from $750 to $30,000 because I doodled this, this evening. It's kind of weird, and that's the world we live in. Now, the copyright is more in-depth. My colleague might say a doodle won't count. There's really no modicum of creativity under NIMR of copyright law, and that's great, but I'm trying to get to a very base example of the world we currently live in. And I don't know about you, but that to me just is absolutely mind-blowing. So back to the founders. Thomas Jefferson, considered the primary author of the Constitution, his letters argued the Progress Clause outright. He didn't want it, because he believed it was a monopoly. Full stop. But in reply, Madison simply referred to these monopolies as nuisances. We've got to do it. We have to incentivize the author. So let's do it 14 years. Let's just figure it out before we get the next Copyright Act going. We have to. Our British friends are doing it. So why shouldn't we? So. Constitution, and we get the first Copyright Act, and it's 14 years, point blank, with the extension, much like the statute of it, which was nearly entirely modeled off of, except for the fact we did not give credence to foreign authors. Their reasoning was quite unique, because they wanted foreign authors' texts to fall into the public domain, so libraries could have them, so you could view Dickens. And he was one of the biggest critics of not having a foreign copyright law, because he says, well, why is my American buddy Twain get a copyright and I don't? Their reply was, well, Dickens, you can have your own copyright in the UK, if you want to publish in the United States, it will fall into the public domain so everyone can view these. And that's really cool, if you don't mind asking me. It's proliferation of knowledge. And I think everyone in this room can, can agree with me. Knowledge is a key and is a power to an American citizen. It's a citizen of the world. The more you know, the more you're able to read, the better off you're going to be. And that's what the founders saw and thought of when they considered the, the first the Progress Clause and then, of course, the first Copyright Act. Oh, dear. Well, <laughs> in closing, I have a whole other speech period, but in closing, before I started this day, I wrote in my notes, everything is remix. And I'm going to kind of harp back to that the rest of the day. The idea you can use YouTube now, and you can clip, and under fair use, this limitation exception I mentioned earlier, you could upload that clip to YouTube, and you have your own video. You can make a profit. There's remix music. Hip-hop essentially is based on remix. I don't know about you, but I'd be really sad if hip-hop didn't exist nowadays. And that's the world we live in, and a constricted copyright law or intellectual property law per se would hinder these advancements. Thank you. Now we'll do cross-examination. Three minutes, a mere three minutes each for the affirmative speaker to cross-examine the negative speaker, and then the negative to cross-examine the affirmative. A bare three minutes. So make your question brief. Make your answer brief. <laughs> In everything you said, Sasha, I didn't hear you refute the idea that copyright is a property right. Would you say that copyright is a property right? Oh, we're going back and forth. Yeah. 
<laughs> Again, I'm going to go back to my original statement that I don't think they're in tandem with real property per se and the idea of copyright as property. I think it's an intangible. I think there is a place for it, but again, there's limitation exceptions, which I don't see within, say, owning a chair or owning a house. Okay, so there's actually types of property that you can own in tandem. For instance, you can be tenants in common uh, over a piece of real property in which you can have two owners concurrently owning one piece of land. They both have the same rights to occupy, the same rights to exclude others, but they can't exclude each other. How does that fit into your concept of matching intellectual property onto real property? Simply because you need to have licensing rights from the owner. I need to go to the owner, license from them, and they need to get permission for a fee. But you have the, the, an, the analogy in real property law. You can have, for instance, life tenants who inherit less of the particular piece of land for a limited period of time. That, you know, all of these, these are all just, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying before. The attributes of the property are the, how you deploy them in the legal system, but they don't change the fundamental nature of whether you can own the thing itself. I would say we're going then to the system of renting. And I'd have to go back to my original statement, which is licensing agreements. And I can rent from said owner for a fee, and said owner can allow me to use the property as I want. And within the prior, I can't the word I cannot pronounce in a way that <laughs> say the deeds or sorry the contracts that's fit. But the, the renting is a good example though, because you can own a, an apartment and you can lease it out, and then you can also sell the apartment to a new owner who can lease it out separately. So you see attributes of owning and leasing in real property the same way you do in intellectual property. I just don't see a fundamental distinction there. I'm going to have to go to a original statement that you simply license for a limited term. And I just, I'm finding with myself difficulty to unpack this question the way that you pose. So I feel as I'm continually we're kind of asking and going back with the, fourth right. the same question and answer that I'm still going to say my original statement that there's a system of licensing and a system of rents and therefore secondary monopolies that are created. So just so because intellectual property can be licensed, it's therefore not property? Well, not property in, in the legal sense that we've constructed earlier. Okay, so it's not property because it can be licensed, but it, it's okay for real property to be essentially licensed as a lease and still be considered property, correct? I would have to say no in that context there's a tangible ownership that intellectual property doesn't have. Intellectual property is fully based on a contract of the depository that you have to go with the copyright office granted by the government and not a personal individual. But there was common law copyright before it was statutory. That is correct, but as I noted that they tried to do a state, uh, state copyright and then we had to go federal because the problems at the time were the United States couldn't handle right. having its own state-based and common copyright law. And okay. there is no dicta based on the previous common copyright law. It's all been statutory based ever since 1790. Then that concludes the affirmative speaker's cross-examination of the negative speaker. Wow. That's <laughs> not to cross-examine the affirmative speaker. <laughs> Oh, this is exciting. <laughs> Again, I am terribly nervous, and I should repeat, I'm not a real debating person, so I was thank you all for letting me be here, and let me wobble on through as we go. So that was seven seconds just wasted. <laughs> Nine, seconds. Nine seconds. So how would you consider, we didn't really go over the idea of, I'd like to go back to software and ownership. Why, if, in your opinion, why can't I own, since you're a software engineer, or computer science, engineer, I can't own a piece of software because it's a piece of intellectual property. However, if I purchased it outright, I believe I should be able to do so. Can you explain that? So, if, so uh, for instance, like Adobe Photoshop, why can't I just buy Adobe Photoshop versus having to lease it, right? Mm -hmm. well, theoretically, you could. If Adobe wanted to sell you the rights to Adobe Photoshop, you could go to Adobe and say, here's, here's half a billion dollars. I would like to buy Adobe Photoshop. And then you could get it, and then you could not let anybody else ever use it again and not release new updates to it. And anybody who tries to sell it, you could sue them out of existence if you wanted to. But why hasn't Adobe and other companies opening up to do so? Why haven't they gone to the commons yet to allow users to buy outright and modify on their own terms? I, well, I, it's a business decision. I assume that they make a lot more money. I, honestly, I find the, the yearly annual fees mm -hmm. for them kind of annoying, but they make more money doing that and people are willing to pay. Like, so that's why they do it. Just hypothetically, do you believe in that we will eventually reach a point where the commons will soon kind of succeed Adobe Photoshop and so on and so forth that Consumers will eventually get in know this because so you've done yourself. Would you be open to going to a commons model or seeing that as a future? Well, I'm not opposed to the commons. <clears throat> I think that the, the feature of whether it's all market or all commons is an accident in history to some extent. Like all, all licensing and, and, uh, and selling is, is a function of what the transaction costs are involved in the transaction, right? So when things fall into the commons, it was because it was economically inefficient for central registers to figure out who owned what. 
but as we move into a, a greater monitored, great, more greatly monitored system using technology, I think actually there won't necessarily be a, a reason for there to be a commons. Cool. And can we go over back to term limits I explored earlier? The 14 year term limit is the original term limit about the statute and the first copyright act, and it's continued like exponentially gone up to about 120 years, give or take. Do you believe that's too long? If so, why? And if not, yeah. I'd love to know reasons otherwise. I, so the term length is, so I, the, the term length of copyright, how long you're allowed to own it right now, is what, life of the author plus 70 years, yeah. I think? Which is a very long time. <laughs> uh, I don't know, it seems kind of long. I don't know that it's too long or what, what the right length is. I would love to see an empirical study on it. I, I haven't really seen one. Um, what I look at when I think about the term length is uh, that I'm actually okay with an entity owning a copyright for a long time as long as they're taking care of it. I think, for instance, I'm a comic book geek. I love that <laughs> Disney's doing great work with Marvel Studios. If they stop doing great work with it, I think there probably should be some exception, like in trademarks, where it falls into disuse. Interesting. Do you want to ask question? This is a brisk discussion. These guys are doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> You're a great moderator. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Also, yeah. we actually do really enjoy each other's presence and work yeah, all yeah. together. <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think Sasha makes a good case for talking about um, problems that are in the copyright system. And I'm willing, completely willing to admit that as it's been implemented, there's, there's rough edges that need to be filed down. But I didn't hear anything f uh, fundamentally in what she said that rebuts the notion that copyright should be considered a property right that can be traded and sold and, and descended and licensed, even though it is kind of annoying to, that you have to worry about violating property rights when you want to um, tinker with your phone. That's just the way things are. And what we're not looking, we're not looking for the world of the perfect, we're looking for the world of the good enough. And what you have to always assess when you're thinking about any particular type of property rights system is, am I on net seeing a greater yield of welfare to society than less? Because again, I think property is consequentially justified. And you always have to do that evaluation, whether it's ownership of houses or ownership of intellectual property. And I personally just have not seen anything that suggests that copyright should be uh, treated as anything except a property right. I yield the rest of my time. Wow, a bold, a bold move. <laughs> <laughs> Sasha, your uh, negative rebuttal, four minutes. Yes, sir. Again, I think my colleague is, when he said we shouldn't negate the negative with perfect, that's a really brilliant statement. I just continually go back to the prompt that we were given was that this was in the founding father's vision of how we saw intellectual property eventually progressing. So Christian, I'm going to do this one question. Do you believe this has been the founding father's vision knowing that the letters of Madison and Jefferson right. said otherwise? And or even this case that we shouldn't really care about Jefferson thought? I think it was a long time ago. <laughs> this is in cross-examination. Oh. Do, do you want me to? Okay. Oh. A, weasel, a weasel answer on that. I, I actually do think it is, but also don't think it is in a certain sense. So when the founders talked about monopoly privileges, they were talking about a different kind of thing than what we think about when we talk about monopoly these days. The term has morphed over the centuries. The Monopoly privileges were this thing that really irritated uh, the founding generation, a lot of thinkers at the time. Uh, it was uh, the crown in England would go to a particular tinker and say, you're allowed to be the only tinker in the kingdom, or to a particular blacksmith and say, you're the only blacksmith, and that's what they called monopoly privileges. So when, when Jefferson was thinking about monopoly privileges in, in this respect, he, was, he had a bad taste in his mouth from the fact that the crown was essentially being protectionist and handing out particular industries to people. I think that what they did want to do with that clause was promote the progress of arts and sciences. And I think that what has in fact happened in copyright and patent is that we've seen an explosion, a tremendous explosion in the knowledge economy over the last uh, two centuries and, and change that in fact justify that, that congressional control. And because I accidentally have half my time, I just quickly to point to a study that was conducted by Grelly and Mosa on opera. So it was pointed out to my colleague at Chris Spring at NYU Law School. Essentially, Opera was studied between late 1700s to the early 1900s, and who had a five-year copyright term limit and who had none between the two different countries. They found out an empirical study that more pieces of wonderful music that we still listen to today, so like Amazon's top opera, by about an mm, average of 2.12% were produced in the countries that did not have a statutory copyright law. And that this is not going for just like, oh, there are more people writing and people popular. These are pieces that we still listen to today. And I think that statistic alone shows that onerous copyright sometimes can be constricting and not incentivizing on the whole. And I'm good. <laughs> that concludes yours. Another bold stroke. You're supposed to mic drop. <laughs> Another bold stroke to conclude so quickly. Um, now, back to Christian for the affirmative closing statement. Okay, 
This is where he attempts to knock it out of the park and bring you to your feet. Can <laughs> uh, I fall over at that point? <laughs> <laughs> you'll do the same. Uh, but, I, okay, I may not even use my whole of my three minutes because I think that our back and forth in my opening statement covered a lot of the ground I want to cover. But essentially, as I've said a few times now, whether something is a property right or not has nothing to do with whether it annoys us. Okay, we have a property right. In my opinion, when we believe that on net it makes it enhances social welfare, and I think Sasha's study is very interesting. I'd like to look at it more. But I think if you look at the, you know, going afield from copyright, if you look at the development of the drug industry on the patent side, if you look at the production of these giant mega blockbuster movies, which you may not like personally, I thought Doctor Strange was a work of art, and I loved it. You would not get that kind of production if you did not have a reasonable return on your investment. And I think that's what copyright gives to us. It gives us that, that sense of, of uh, peace of mind for, for firms that want to invest a lot of money in the production of these, these goods and services, and then we get that production. And that's not to say that a, a commons model can't operate alongside it. You, you see our artists all the time releasing stuff uh, on a pay-as-you-wish type of basis uh, or at a, a diff on a different model. Louis C.K., he put out his uh, comedy show a few years ago for five bucks as a download from his website. He could have done that whether it was copyrighted or not. So there, there, it can exist alongside that, but just because there are problems with implementation, I don't think that we should be so skeptical of the fact that we should protect, at least have the option of protecting uh, copyright and other intellectual property as property rights. And I yield. Wow. Another bold stroke, yielding back time. Uh, Sasha, three minutes. Thank you, sir. So I have to reestablish, I am not totally against intellectual property. Some of my colleagues are, and uh, all power to them. But I do believe these need a balanced system. So. I have a series of really fun quotes from people you may or may not hear of. I'll be really young in this audience, but I see some old folk to the right. You can raise your hands, old folk. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if you guys know John Perry Barlow, but he was a leading cyber libertarian, lyricist for the Grateful Dead, and founding member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which my former boss when I was on the Hill was a member of. It was widely known. So he said back in 2011, the EG8 summit, I don't regard my expression as a form of property. Property is something that can be taken from me. If I don't have it, somebody else does. Expression isn't like that. The notion that expression is like that is simply entirely a consequence of a taking of a system of expression and transporting it around, which was necessarily before the internet of it, which is, has the capacity to infinitely do it at all, no cost. So, and while as intellectual property may seem extreme, I would like to posit this fact. Intellectual property is referred to today, trademarks, patents, and copyrights is a relatively new term. So I'm talking about intellectual property of those two words that encompass those three terms in those three legal fields. Um, through a quick, and as Mark Lemley of Stanford Law School put, a very unscientific study, he found the Terry search from intellectual property on basically a Westlaw of our nexus. And he found from 1943 to 1953, the, the term had been used 201 times, as opposed to 1993 to 2003, when it had been used a total of 3,800 in 63 terms, times. So what's happened in the property and technological age? What did Barlow mean by expression isn't like that? I, I, I imagine him going, expression isn't like that, man. <laughs> well, for one, patents are ideas and copyrights and expression. An opinion by Sandra Day Hunter for the majority in Harper and Rowe Publishers versus Nation Enterprises, a case dealing to what extent fair use provision and copyright sanctions the unauthorized use of quotations from public figures and published manuscripts, she states copyright is nearly not facts or ideas, it is expression, the stamp of the author's originality. And while technology continues to develop as we share ideas, owner's copyright stifles this expression. So copyright isn't simply property per se, it's an artistic expression, and as such, we no longer need to consider as exclusionary principle in the way real property is often considered. I can go through the rest, but I'm not going to low on time. So I'm just going to end with John Perry Barlow and Frederick Hayek agree on one thing. It, the importance of property rights, but also the need for intellectual property to be taken in a different way. And as Lawrence Lustig said earlier, everything's a remix, most things are derivative, and if we have onerous copyrights, we can't create and incentivize individuals to do more. And under time, thank you very much. Let's uh, congratulate and applaud. We, we didn't check your opinions ahead of time, so we can't compare your opinions now, but afterwards, through, uh, through various toasts, I suppose, you can, you can uh, inform the debaters about who you think uh, won. But we've, we've got ample time for Q&A, and I actually want to ask a couple of questions 
uh, to, to start things off, take the moderator's privilege to do so. But think about your questions, because we, we probably will have time for them. Uh, let me ask the administrators, are we recording on microphone so that I need to make sure that the Q&A is on microphone? I'll go Phil Donahue style, perhaps, <laughs> during the, during the Q&A, so your voices can be heard uh, on the recording that, that uh, is available for future posterity. Let me start by asking you a, a question, Christian, because you uh, drew a, a tight and usually correct uh, parallel between social welfare uh, and property rights. I think it's uh, very true that property rights in general have improved social welf welfare. That's almost obvious, and in a, in a room like this, we're going to think so. Everyone here should agree to that. If you're not, you're a communist and right. get, get out. <laughs> but I don't know that it's a given. I don't know that it's a given that uh, every the guy who got up to, to leave, he's actually staying just because of the free drinks afterwards. <laughs> communist. It's free stuff. Uh, I don't think it's a given that anything that improves social welfare yeah. thus is a grounds for, for, for creating a property right. Uh, you end up, I think, undirected because you have to have a theory of justice for what improves social welfare. Mm. Uh, anyone can decide for themselves and a political leader could decide for the community that that's an improvement on social welfare mm. and it ends up being something that kills a lot of people or drives inequality or whatever the case may be. So, so. Uh, Explain to me better this this tie that appeared to be in your in your uh, discussion about social between social right. welfare and property rights. So social does property really follow anything that you think? Uh, but one thing I would point out that you just said that the the leader could say, well, you know, killing a lot of people enhances social welfare. I would say that's self-refuting to some extent. I, there have been leaders in history. You know, I, I think that the consensus, especially of the people being killed, would be that it's not enhancing social welfare. Or he's marched away. Right, that's right, that's right. Uh, so I think that, um, no, not everything that improves social welfare is a property right. What I think a property right is, as a legal entity, is a claim that society is prepared to recognize over a particular thing, that society is allowing you to make that claim because it doesn't enhance social welfare. And that's got to be something that the community decides is true. My point was to say that um, that's the beginning of understanding what property rights are. Property rights then get filled in, like what are the types of things that you're willing to protect. I happen to think that real property is pretty self-obvious, that's, you know, that's what we started with, but I think that intangible property, there's no fundamental reason why you should look at intangible, the tangibility or the intangibility of a thing and say, well, therefore that's property and that's not. I think logically speaking, it's a thing that we want to be able to trade that people value and that uh, uh, should be some kind of tradable item that on net does in increase social welfare by, welfare by doing that trading and we should regard it as property on that ground. Let me explore just a little bit further into, into social welfare because there is a question about how you measure it. I told at the outset, I told the story of the soccer field up in Northwest mm -hmm. uh, where you could easily, easily argue, well look, the, the organizers of the, the formal soccer game are paying $760 in for the permit. Mm -hmm. That's $760 in wealth. Right. Well, there's this unmeasured benefit of all these other soccer games uh, that inspired the community to get together and organize themselves. Right. Just There just wasn't an exchange of money. So right. how's your, how's, what's your social well, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a problem of property in general. Like, like I tried to say very quickly at the beginning, uh, any property system can be potentially improved upon. You, there might be a theoretical way. I, you know, don't, don't ride on me. Maybe Marx was right. Maybe having, having uh, no private property, maybe that is a way to get there if we could get there without the brutal dictatorships that kill everyone first. It might be better to have a non-tragedy to the commons. We've never witnessed that in the history of mankind, but it might be. Um, so the, the measurement, you know, it's the same problem you have with measuring, like, well, you know, like housing patterns. Like, what's the most optimal housing pattern? I, I don't know what it is. That We leave it to economists to figure that out for us. I think you can do the same thing with intellectual property. Let me turn to, to Sasha. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that I didn't think I would. But you conceded a lot in terms of whether copyright is a property right or not. And maybe it's a, you know, there's, a, there's a, an argument, a fascinating argument, whether it's good or not, we can, we can decide for ourselves, that intellectual property protections, copyright, patent, are an invasion of our natural rights in ownership of ourselves. Clear example being the happy birthday song. If you stand up in front of a room at a bar and you sing happy birthday with your own voice, using the power of your lungs, having been fed by food that you worked for and bought, <laughs> You're suddenly violating someone else's property right. That's your body 
essentially being enslaved, I'm exaggerating the case, <laughs> by, by, by intellectual property yeah. rights. Yeah. It's gone into the public domain, so it's not a good example, but pick any modern well, song. Well, pretend last year. Pretend it's last year. Uh, I wanna, what's that song, Happy? That awful yeah. big hat guy? Yeah, I'm happy. Let's use that. Yeah. Not happy birthday, but happy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, so there's a real conflict of rights, and real systems of rights are not supposed to have conflicts like that. And, and a sort of uh, inductive point to that effect is the almost drug war-like proportions that copyright enforcement could go to if it were left to its own devices. You see, you see where there were, have been say, attacks on the internet uh, sponsored by the, the copyright uh, reliant industries and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating all kinds of ways, drug <laughs> war-like. But, but give, us your, give us your defense, if, if you would, of the point that copyright is not a property right. It's your obligation, having taken the negative. <laughs> That's a loaded question. So I'd <laughs> I yeah, have to go to the idea of licensing, but I do want to quickly go over a quick example that I think a lot of you in the room might be able to acknowledge and recognize, which is Comic-Con, which happened this past weekend. So cosplaying, it's dressing up like your favorite cartoon characters. This is a Japanese term, I believe. I could be wrong. And a lot of cosplayers kind of live in the fear of being sued by holders of copyright. Now, Articles, useful articles per se, can't be copyrighted. That's up to debate. But the premise support uh, case of varsity branch, I do not want to get into right now. But let's just pretend somebody owns the copyright of the character, I don't know, insert X superhero here because the superhero is unique, therefore they can have a copyright on the character and therefore the character's look. You dress up like said superhero, somebody from Universal goes to Comic Con and says, hey, you look all that superhero I, I, I got a copyright for. Boom, that's a copyright infringement because it's willful. You're subject to statutory damages and personal damages as well. That's a problem. So a lot of cosplayers kind of tinker, they fiddle with it, they do like an extra tail. I don't know, I don't want to watch comics, I'm sorry, <laughs> or read comics, but they'll figure out a way to tinker. So when Universal goes to Comic-Con, they say, well, my is a different costume. I'm not that character. I'm Sailor, Sailor, I don't know, Sailor so Milky Way Galaxy, not Sailor Moon. I'm totally different, even though I approach Sailor Moon. That's problematic. So copyright as a property right, kind of scaling back towards that, it's the licensing agreements that people have to pull out, which are incredibly onerous. And I would love to go into further debate with, with my colleagues here and why it's not a, cop a property right per se, but I think that's, we didn't have enough time. I don't feel like that's, I can do that at this moment. But I want everyone to continually think about the Comic-Con example, because that is real, it happens, and it's an unfortunate situation. Even better, we had a recent case called Lens, so I'm uploads a video for baby dancing princes, let's go crazy in the bathroom. I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to know who Prince is, but it's like barely audible. And I wrote about this going, I can barely hear let's go crazy in the bathroom, but because Prince had an army of individuals scaling the YouTube channels, just see if they hear a few seconds of any Prince's song, then file notice and take down. Now it's a more complex case than just that. But the fact that the mother has been continually fighting for years to get her video back of her baby just dancing up and down to a really great song that you barely can hear in the background, that's when copyright goes a little bit too far extreme. And when you have armies of people doing your dirty work for you, as opposed to just somebody saying, hey, that's my song, take it down. Because I'm sure most users just go, okay, I messed up. I'll take it down, or let's talk about it. Let's do a back and forth, and then get YouTube to intermediate between and go, well, you're wrong or you're right instead of having to go to the courts to flesh all this out. I realized earlier that, uh, that I made a cultural reference that might not appeal to the younger set. There, were, there was a guy named Phil Donahue back in the day. Before Oprah. Look up, look up the it Phil Donahue. Uh, b before Jerry Springer. Um, look up his interview, uh, Phil Donahue, of, of, Milton, of Milton Friedman. He's, he's still he's alive. Look up his interview with Milton Friedman. It's fascinating watching, and it's the stuff we watched in the afternoons uh, when television was good, kids. I'm going to try and do a film, Donahue. You two, let's uh, have you share the microphone here, but uh, I'll walk around and get your questions. I'm being deprived of my Phil Donahue right. You are welcome to do it. I'm going to walk around and get the questions. I'm going to walk around and get the questions, and you two share the mic and, and answer them, please. Hello, this is mainly directed to uh, Christian, um, and forgive me if this, the premise I'm starting with isn't, isn't correct, but um, the argument is that the system of property rights that we have, is, that the reason that it's so good and is for the betterment of social welfare is because it's a scarce resource, but isn't there an argument 
that you know intellectual property like it's the human imagination it's not a scarce resource so it can't be treated similarly based on that fundamental difference and i'd like to hear your thoughts on that that's, that's a really good question uh, and then i think a lot of people tend to take that tack with it but what you have to think about is it's, is, it, is it the raw imagination that's the resource or is it the production from the imagination that's the resource, right? Like, I have a lot of ideas. Like I said, I'm a musician. I write songs. No one listens to them because no one cares about my songs. But, the, you know, Michael Jackson, he wrote amazing songs and everybody really wanted those songs. So what was actually scarce was not the fact that there's potential songwriters out there, but that he did those particular songs that everyone likes to listen to. So that's where scarcity is. And, you know, it's hard to enforce, you know, like you play the song, we all listen to it. So the scarcity is not in the actual listening of it, it's in the production of it. So what we're actually monetizing when we monetize intellectual property is that scarce production, those rare geniuses who actually write something that's worth listening to and reading. Yeah. Well, let Sasha say a word while I go to the next question. All right, Sasha, time's up. <laughs> my name is Kami Bhatt. I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. And my question is if uh, uh, the, the statue uh, of uh, uh, statue interpretation, uh, uh, the legislation about uh, intellectual property and copyright should be reinterpreted in the sense the access uh, 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 of technology and uh, my, the background of my question is, since I'm internationalist, I, I belong to Pakistan, and I know a lot of journalists from India, Pakistan, uh, when there's an event here, event ends there, and it's midnight there, so they have to send something quickly or immediately. They don't have time to write, even they are good writers, so they just copy-paste from American media and send it to, to their back home country, and they are making you know, they're living from this job. So if you apply these uh, intellectual property and copyright uh, laws to them, these people would be in prison and then they would be deported. Uh, I mean, if you really apply those rules. Uh, so it, it's not applicable nowadays. In other words, uh, intellectual property and copyright. So don't you think that judges should kind of reinterpret those statute and legislation about these two issues? Thanks. And secondly, I Give you another example. I have a lot of uh, international uh, Facebook friends from other country, and I've been here for more than 30 years, but I speak and write broken English. And sometimes I see their perfect English, and you can Google their perfect English, and you can find their copy paste from some, somewhere else. So, in other words, it's so easy for anybody who doesn't have any English education to put those things, copy paste those things, and put and just to you know have their good impression about themselves so i mean this is not applicable in other words copyright and intellectual property thanks i don't know if that was really um a question per se thank you so much for your thoughts um i do like copying pasting unless there's a medical creativity that makes it fair use and derivative and four factors that's different than me just stealing christian's music and making it my own and trying to proliferate it I think that distinction needs to be made. I think American jurisprudence has been kind of faltering, but the statute itself, I believe, needs a lot of reform, term limits especially. I think we need more rest. We need to really consider fair use. The courts are doing quite a good job of that right now, but again, I can't, I just, I can't get behind the idea of copying, pasting as legal. And I don't know if we can, we, I just don't know if we can get, I can see the utility behind that. I see the utility behind translating and figuring out for other countries and making information more available in public for good and newsworthy. I think that could, that could break a line and that could be usable, but I just, I'm struggling with that question right now. Christian, any thoughts? Yeah. So, so uh, don't take this as legal advice, but you know, what's, what, what's legal is what you essentially can get away with. So if you guys are not getting deported, it's because no one's caught them. So, but I actually do think it's illegal. It would be illegal under our laws in two different ways. I think it is a violation of copyright, but I actually think that if a prosecutor went after them, they would use unfair competition laws. There's a famous case, INS, that was almost exactly those facts that you just read out that every property law student probably got when they were in law school. Um, and honestly, if they, you know, what they should do if they actually want to qualify for a fair use exemption, they should actually write a new story. Take, you can take big chunks out of a story and write some creative elements around it, and now it's your story. That's completely fair news reporting. That's what I would tell them to do. Don't try to break the law. That's not my legal advice. <coughs> Phil Donahue would say something clever as he walks. I've got nothing. I'm Mike Nelson. I work for Cloudflare, but 20 years ago I worked in the Clinton White House and some of these issues came up. 
one of my colleagues there thought it would be a really good idea to request that the National Science Foundation do some projects to fund economists to look at the fundamental economics of copyright. Like issues like how long should the term of a copyright be? I thought it was a good idea. He was informed very quickly by certain copyright industry people that we don't want any of this analysis. One of the few projects that have been done in the last 20 years found that the ideal term of copyright, if your goal is to maximize utility to society, not to Walt Disney, the term should be somewhere between seven and 12 years. And those gentlemen up there in that picture got it kind of right when they said 14 years was about the right term. 10 years ago, I was part of a National Academy project to try to get more funding for economics of copyright. We still don't have more than a handful of people trying to do this work because there's no federal funding for it. Nobody else is funding it. Is this going to change? And do you think the analysis that says our copyright term should be less than 15 years is, is well, valid? I think that sounds like a good Cloudflare-sponsored project, right, Mike? Like they, I think you guys, that might be something you guys... But I do, I do take your point. I think that there probably, there has to be some sort of economic analysis of what the right copyright term length is. And I, that's why like, I was a little weasley on it, because I honestly, I, I don't know. I think it is an economic question. Um, because, and, and it's not going to be totally social welfare, like, because, I, mean, I guess it would be if you did a right, the right analysis. Right. You, 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 uh, what I was thinking was, well, you want to make sure you reward the inventors. But part of rewarding the, the, the authors is the fact that it, in, it, it increases total social welfare output, right? So I personally would love to see economic analysis on it. And I would be happy to engage with it. I mean, you know, it's, I think that's the way to do it. I just want to hug you. <laughs> no, I think you make a really fair point. And I, as someone who's often on the Hill, quite often, an advocacy role. I would love to see more engagement from lawmakers in this topic, pressuring the Copyright Office or Library of Congress, technically, to look into this, this type of study. And I think there is definitely room through the right channels, through the right committee work, to, to hopefully see this happen. And if there is other outside interests to maybe with other industries who may not be as favorable, I think if we continue to make the advocacy push and folk like Christian and I can come together, there's a possibility of it. But to build a cadre of people who actually <laughs> do the analysis. It takes a five or ten year program, right. probably at the National Science Foundation. And I think that's something that's needed and needs to happen sooner and later because we're going to continue to have these spiraling conversations where folk like Christian and I, we agree on most of the stuff. But yeah, we're sitting here in adversarial roles when we could find really great common ground and it's going to take five to seven years. That's great because at least in five to seven years from now we can come together and say, well, we agree on X, Y, and Z. A, B, and C are not so much, and then we come new conversation as opposed to recycling the current conversations we've been having for, gosh, 30 years now, <laughs> although I am only 29, but this world. <laughs> A great question, uh, raising the public choice dynamics in deciding in legislative process what the scope and breadth of a, of a property right would be. Um, it it uh, cut off the question that I was going to ask, so I salute you for yours. So uh, I wanted to ask a question about the hi, hi Sasha, <laughs> hi Christian, um, about the uh, First Amendment and free speech, right? Free speech is such a core issue in the libertarian movement and the conservative movement, and copyright, if it is a property right, it's a property right in often in a form of speech, if not always in a form of speech. And I wanted to hear your thoughts on kind of the conflict between the property rights debate and the free speech debate that, that copyright presents. So I'll, I'll start out by going out on a limb and saying that I love rights. I would love to see the Prisoner Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment revived as like an infinite source of rights for people to board with that. And I love free speech. But the, the nature of rights is the fact that they can conflict. So just because there is a free speech aspect to copyright because it is expressive content that we're, we're thinking about here. But rights conflict, and what courts do is they help us navigate where the contours of those conflicts should come out. And generally speaking, I feel like we're roughly in the right neighborhood of allowing property rights in expression because, I, like I said, I think it does yield better social welfare. And that I don't see, in our society at least, um, a lot of censorship occurring as a result of property rights. Um, the, the, the stuff that I would be, well, I, I, I know the Cloudflare issues. Uh, <coughs> right, 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 
we, we, could, we could discuss those if you want. But I think my position would be, um, generally speaking, I don't see the censorship in our society as, as a giant concern right now in property rights. I think Mike really disagrees with that. But. <laughs> Actually, I kind of want to hear Mike's thoughts on the issue. Um, again, copyright and, co and free speech are not my expertise, so thanks, thanks a lot, Josh. I really appreciate that question. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to just not answer, but however, <laughs> but do make a note that there, I was reading something through material this weekend, and there was a fascinating paper that was produced by Georgia Tech, I believe, and it drew out how the founders deeply, deeply, deeply pondered over the exact question you posed, Josh, and notes and letters back and forth, and they found themselves bound by this. And I think that kind of goes back to the fact that Jefferson was continuing, like, this is a monopoly, and then we had the nuisance come by Madison, and then you had the free speech clause come in. So to say that this question wasn't pondered over extensively would be an understatement. I think in the new applications and the continued censored uses and limited uses the copyright has developed into, we've run into the problem you spoke about earlier, and it just need to be discussed further on a later date. We've got about three minutes left, so I think that's probably time for one question. Who's got the burning question? Or a question? Uh, another difference between me and Phil Donahue is he had a, a shock of white hair. <laughs> I don't have that. I, I have even less. So, <laughs> I have a question for Mr. Stout. Uh, Mr. Stout, you said that you see some problems with uh, intellectual property, so I would like to know what is your view on that? What the problems with the intellectual property system? Uh, so, I, uh, problems in the implementation, I mean, any part of the legal system that you're going to have those. I think um, one of the areas that I think about a lot lately is in intermediary liability. I think that um, many people might not agree with me, but I think that actually co content does not get protected well enough online in a lot of cases. Um, I think that uh, the DMCA, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, was passed in 98, I believe. Uh, it was a good first step to try to figure out how to help um, uh, people uh, have businesses online that um, facilitated production of this content and got it distributed in a way that pr gave them um, reasonable assurances they wouldn't be sued out of existence. But I think that when you see that, for instance, Google processes, what is it, like 50 million takedown notices a month or something like that, I think that suggests that there's something in the system that needs to be tweaked to get the balance right. And part of it is going to be inter intermediary liability issues, like, for instance, how much responsibility a particular platform has for the content on the services. Um, I think that there's probably got to be something a little bit more that the platforms have to do now in order to, to give more protection to, to content producers. So I love the fact that Google's sifting through that many notice, uh, notifications a month because that shows that individuals are creating more, yes, might be pirated, and so on and so forth. But it's, the DMCA is an equal burden regime under 512. So it's, you've got a problem, you report it, I got a problem saying no, it's the content, you go back, and we go back and forth, and eventually it's either video's taken down or we go to court. And that's kind of the lens case talk about the dancing baby. I think that is a brilliant compromise. And it nearly didn't come to happen. This, it was Ashcroft who came in and said, there has to be continually back and forth. There has to be a continuum. Because if you don't have that balance, it'll, it'll, someone will ultimately have the, be with all the burden on them set, essentially. So while I totally agree with Christian, there's a lot of pirated content. Like, That's not good. Stop pirating. It's not nice. People like Christian need to pay their bills with their guitar solos. And I need to eventually be an amateur photographer with my cat. She's awesome. But I think this regime as we have it now is not perfect, but it's working. And as long as every individual has a say in this matter, which they currently do, let it be. <laughs> this is a really difficult topic. If you didn't already know that, you know it now. And a difficult format that I think both Sasha and Christian performed very well in. Uh, so join me in thanking Christian Stout and Sasha Myers for a tremendous performance. Thank you for being here. Thanks to our hosts. And let's continue the discussion outside with some drinks. Thanks again.